Have you ever thought about investing in property or starting a property business or any business or even scaling a business to multiple millions of pounds? Well, if you have, this video is gonna be really helpful because guys, I get to share an amazing conversation that I had with James Sinclair. If you don't know who James is, he's a fantastic entrepreneur, business owner, property investor. Um, he's got multiple businesses, a huge property portfolio. He turns over millions every single year. He's got a humongous staff team. Um, I got the privilege of going and spending a bit of time with a few of his staff members and, and meeting James and chatting with him. And, it was absolutely brilliant. I tell you what, it was such a valuable conversation and I know that you're going to get a lot of value from it. So make sure that you stay tuned to enjoy that. But just quickly, if you are interested in property deals, make sure that you click the link in our description and sign up to our free mailing list. We send out, me and my team, we send out every single week incredible property deals direct to your inbox for you to choose whether you want to invest or not in those particular deals it's an incredible opportunity for anybody who is looking at seriously getting into property so make sure if you are click the link in the description sign up the mailing list is completely free and we just love to be able to help people start and scale their property portfolios but guys if you're interested in property if you're interested in business this video is going to be so so helpful so stay tuned and i hope you enjoy it so james hi jack how you doing i'm good thank you good 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 it's really nice to be here yeah thank you for really coming nice down and seeing me at marsh farm cheers for anyone who doesn't know you yeah please could you let the audience know what you do who you are i suppose um i could be classed as an entrepreneur um i've got just shy of a thousand staff, multiple different businesses in the family, entertainment, education sectors. We own a chain of day nurseries, a couple of zoo, farm attractions. Um, we also do quite a bit of commercial property, got quite an extensive residential portfolio as well. Um, we make teddy bears um, and we sell teddy bears to holiday parks and zoos and attractions across the UK. Um, we also make arts and crafts stuff for holiday parks. It's a big part of our business and growing. Um, and we've got a big chain of indoor play centres and we make ice cream as well, the Rossi Ice Cream Company. So it sounds like a big mix of yeah. stuff, but actually we like to think of it as an ecosystem where one's supporting the other. Mm. So for example, we buy a quarter of a million pounds worth of ice cream from our ice cream company and sell it in all of our attractions. Okay. Um, so yeah, and we buy loads of teddy bears and it's stuff for our gift shops and our birthday party. So th those th things all come round. So it's an ecosystem that all works together. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like, and from what I've seen of, of all your content online, a lot of your businesses, exactly like you say, it's an ecosystem. They all kind of play to each other's strengths and can yeah. feed into each other whilst being their own separate entity. It's very much entertainment, isn't it, what you're into? Yeah, I mean, is that how you, so, is so that we, how you describe our tagline it? is building brands that families love. So okay. we're family brands. Um, I, I even was going to call our business at one point Family Brands Limited. I thought it was so boring. I decided <laughs> to move away from that. But, yeah, I mean, everything we do fits in that space. And, so no, we wouldn't, you know, I don't know, go and open a construction firm. That's not what we yeah. are. Um, so, so we're very much, other than our property stuff, but the property stuff is to give us security and funding to be able to grow the trading business, which I always think is the smartest way that you can leverage property. Mm. Interesting. So you would say it's very family orientated then? Yeah, we, we want to be, you know, our core market is two to ten year olds mm. and their families. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're a family, a business that's focused on building brands that families love. So whether it's childcare, days out, uh, or products for families, that's that's where we're at. What was it like in your family growing up then? Um, well, I didn't really enjoy my childhood, so okay. I, probably that's why I have sort of done all these things. Yeah. Yeah, and right now you've got, I've seen a picture with you and you. Yeah, yeah, I've got two kids, two Harvey kids. and Darcy, five yeah. and two. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they're wonderful. And so they're potentially... Is, is that what maybe feeds into your businesses in terms of the drive no, behind it? Like, what no, is, what is really. it that drew I mean, you they've, to they've families? been around for five years and I've been doing it for 20 years now. I'm yeah. 37. Yeah. I started when I was 15. I just wanted to leave home, get out um, and, uh, and you know, just do stuff and yeah. build a business. And that's why I focused on doing that. Family's quite important to you. 
and your business is very much focused towards family. I suppose the thing that interests me is that it seems to be the kind of the running theme. I just wondered if that was always the case when you started. You said you you, you left home and you wanted to get going no, in business. I just. Uh... I, was, I loved entertaining people and I built yeah. a family entertainment business first of all and mm. then I didn't want to run a business that was swapping time for money so I was gigging, going out, doing gigs, yeah. um, doing parties and entertainment and shows and so as the years trundled on I tried to build something that wasn't so dependent on my hands to make yeah. money, didn't want to swap time for money, I wanted to build a profitable enterprise to work without me running it. Yeah, that's interesting. So you started out being the entertainer, I suppose some people... Have you read The E-Myth? I assume you probably have. I, don't, I know the book. And, I, and, I, and the, the concept of the three kind of... You've got the entrepreneur, you've got the manager, and you've got the um, technician. Technician's yeah. the person who does the work, manager's the person who oversees it, entrepreneur's the vision, visionary. So you started as a technician, self-employed, entertaining people. Yeah, I suppose I did, yeah. How have you managed to get over the years to the position you're in where you're very much visionary and steering and you're not the technician doing the work day in and day out that's really interesting i just thought uh, so i talk about that called the entrepreneur's pyramid i've come up with my own sort of theory on that yeah so you start off as a solopreneur one-man band that would be his technician in that yeah. book i suppose then i'd say the next stage is entrepreneur and then the top stage is investorpreneur okay. so you're like an entrepreneur on steroids you've got a management team in place and you're yeah. effectively a shareholder of your business rather than running the day-to-day -day of the operation and so i think the first stage in getting that through and making that happening is actually making a decision that you want that to happen. Um, and I made that decision very early on that I was not going to do the things that I didn't enjoy and I wasn't going to run the day to day. <coughs> now, you start off in that solopreneur. As soon as you employ someone, you're an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you start putting management teams in place, you're starting to build something that's not a profitable job anymore, yeah. that's not a profitable business, but you're starting to build a profitable investment. Yeah. Once you've got a profitable investment, you're really starting to go to the races because someone yeah. will buy the thing that you've built. Most people just build profitable jobs and that sort yeah. of hit me in the face at a very young age that all I had was a profitable job. No one's going to want to buy me the entertainer when I retire or if I get ill or something mm. happens to me. And so it's really important that I focused away from doing that. Now, first of all, I did buy some buy-to-lets and do some property stuff, but it's really hard to replace income with that unless you do it at a huge scale and that takes yeah. years to achieve and that's why when I focused on stuff I realised that commercial property was and building businesses was the far better way to go. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I noticed that you do a lot of commercial stuff and we'll probably talk about that later down the line in terms of well, look, the commercial you know, property that you're in. Whether I get involved in business or property, you know, I want to be as high a barrier to entry as possible. Okay. The more higher barrier to entry you are, the more chance you have of making some money. And the best example I give of this is, imagine you've got a hotel and you say, I want to open a six-bedroom hotel. That's very achievable, very easy to do with a bit of hard work, remortgaging, blah, mm. blah, blah. Mm. But I would turn around and say, no, I really want a 100-bedroom hotel with function rooms, a gym. Raise uh, the barrier. You know, I want offices there. You know, Most yeah. people are, oh, my God, that, that, that's blown my mind of how that's achievable. But actually, that's where the money is. Yeah. So the higher barrier entry you go, the more there is in money. Now, you think about your entertainment gigging days uh, that I did. You know, I was swapping time for money. I was a local entertainer. I was making decent money for the time that I was swapping. But if you're a Michael McIntyre or a, yeah, you yeah, know, a yeah. Lee Evans or a Peter Kay, they're at the top of the tree. That's where all the money is. Yeah. So and that's much higher barrier to entry, higher to achieve. Um, it's not necessarily that they're way more talented than people. I've met loads of entertainers at the bottom. Of the they're so super talented, super, mm. super talented. But actually, these people have got what I probably would reckon more commercial awareness, and that's how they've reached the top of the tree. Yeah. You know, someone like Peter Kay, to build a career in comedy like that, there is some commercial awareness around that man. Yeah. Yes, he's super talented, but he's also looking at it as a business. Definitely. So what was the first business then that you stepped back and you went, oh, wow, I'm this investorpreneur well, that of took a, this business? That took a while to do. So I started off with the entertainment business and then I built an entertainment agency and that was the first stage of actually 
getting money in without me using my personal time. And then I built um, a higher company. So I was hiring out bouncy castles, props and disco equipment. But again, low barrier to entry, very me mm, too. Yeah. People can copy you easily. That's why I don't really like buy to lets because yeah. everyone can do it and therefore the, the chances of making monumental success from are really at scale. Mm. Um, and, and it's hard to scale that because yeah. you end up running out of cash and banks get wary and all that stuff. So when I had my entertainment business, I went into prop hire and events, then I thought, right, I need to get a venue because that's higher barrier to entry again. Still not super high barrier to entry, but higher barrier to entry. And then I decided to go in and do outdoor attractions, like mm -hmm. the one that we're sitting in today. And that was when I really felt like I had something that was an investment. Yeah. Because I realised if someone wants to copy what I've got here, they're in for 10, 15 million quid. Yeah. And that just puts you a peg above. Yeah. But people might be watching this thinking, well, that's not for me. How do I achieve that? How do I achieve that? Well, first things first is to start planning out the journey, and it is possible to do in a couple of decades. Yeah. And that's nothing. You know, start. I mean, I got my first outdoor attraction within ten years of starting my business. So, and ten years is nothing. You know, mm. especially if you've got children, you see it fly by. Mm. But it's about having that vision and that plan, and then executing it. Yeah, I call it the business life journey, the steps that a business takes. Um, you know, and it is possible to do. Yeah, yeah. But most people don't know what the end looks like. Yeah, people can't picture it and yeah. therefore they struggle absolutely. To, to actually take the steps. Yeah, absolutely. So in a, in a day to day setting for someone like me and yeah. maybe someone who might be watching, they are they maybe have a small business, they have a small property portfolio. Yeah. One man band maybe have one or two staff members. But they're very much in the business. They're very much working in the business day to day. Yeah. What do they need to do to get to that next step towards the investorpreneur side of things? It's about building a team. Mm. Now, here's the thing, right? I always think about this, especially most people watching this will be buy-to-let property investors. Yeah. You know, if you get yourself 25, 30 grand together to put down a deposit on a house to make 150 to 400 pound of positive cash flow a month after all your costs and your taxes, the way to really catapult a business is actually put it into a full-time member of staff yeah. that will give you your time back to go and do income-generating tasks. Mm. And it blows my mind that people are more nervous about employing someone than they are to go and make between 100 and £400 a month on a buy-to-let. Yeah. And here's the other thing. When you buy the buy-to-let, you've got to have the cash up front. With an employee, you're paying the monthly... Um, and you can... If they're good at what they do, yeah. they make it. And if they're not good, back. you you know, sometimes you have to kiss a few frogs to find your prince. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you let them go and you find other people. Mm. So you... It's build, a... Be, building a team, building yeah. a management team. Like, yeah. My formula for success is E plus M equals S. That's entrepreneurship plus management equals success. Um, and the, you, you've, you can't do both. You can't be operating and growing an enterprise. Yeah. So my job is firmly to grow our business, raise finance, do deals, buy things, build management teams, you know, find opportunities. That's the stuff that I'm doing full time day to day. You don't see me cashing up, opening up, locking up, organising yeah. rotors, because if I do all of that stuff, I'm yeah, not doing the other stuff. Well. And so having that mind space to just mm. go out there and mm. get stuff done. All of my properties I don't Tracy, my PA, looks after all the tenants and all of that stuff. I don't do any of that, but I'm the one that gets the deals over the line. Mm. And then in terms of the going into that investor, um, investor entrepreneur phase, the difficult, I suppose the difficult thing for most people watching this, and myself included, is getting that, that team in place. Oh, the the most sure difficult thing place. is that they have not got the mindset to release some of their own personal cash to pay someone else. Yeah. Now, I was prepared to eat last. Yeah, yeah. That is the absolute reason they will not do it. Yeah. So, you know, I'm 18 years old. I employ a PA secretary person straight away that works from my nan's bedroom. So I'm collecting all my deposits from my entertainers. I'm giving all of that cash to someone else. Yeah. So I'm not benefiting from the business at all whatsoever. And that is the problem that most people have. Mm. They're like, well, why should I be paying someone before me? Yeah. Well, because at the end of 10 years, if you do do that stuff, then you're really going to eat well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
and you have to sacrifice your own personal income for a few months, maybe a year, or maybe even two or three years. Yeah. You know, so I didn't take cash from my business until I was 27, 28, so everything was in, and I was out gigging still. You know, I had a four or five million pound revenue business, and I was still going out doing kids' parties, living off of that money, mm. rather than taking cash from my business. Yeah. I was speaking to somebody the other day who just read the book, something like Profit First, or, yeah. or something like that. It was a great that's book, that. it, it sounds like a great book, but for someone just getting started, they might misinterpret that Absolutely, concept being yeah. make sure that you set aside your no. money first, yeah. your investment, your yeah, savings. Well, once, you're, once you're like, but I, I, you know, what you could do is you could take that money out, then put it back into your business and build up your director's loan account to yeah, show that yeah. you're owed that money. Yeah. And then that's a really good discipline. I do that. Mm. So I take cash out and then put it back in. Yeah. And you're building up that because it feels you're different. Up debt. Once you're yeah. putting it from your personal bank account back to your business, it trains you to be more efficient as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So in terms of team, you spoke about team quite a bit. Yeah. What would you say the fundamentals of finding the right team? And also, have you got any moments where you've gone, I have absolutely nailed this hire, and why was it so good? Well, so I'm writing a book on recruitment right now because I... I'd like to read that. It's called The Dream Team. Yeah. It's about building a team that is effective. And mm -hmm. I think that's the magic word when you're putting teams together and understanding what the culture's like. Now, all businesses, all teams, whether it's a charity, a religion, a business, a school, an army, there is a culture within that organisation. Mm. And the aim of the game is to make sure it's the culture that you want to have an effective team. And this is very, very crucial that you understand that word effectiveness. <laughs> it takes time. Mm. And entrepreneurs are actually sometimes not the best at building teams, but sometimes yeah. they can absolutely hit the jackpot. Yeah. Um, I tell people you have to kiss a few frogs to find your prince. Um, don't be disheartened if you bring in wrong people. Um, always recruit on attitude over skill set and then try and yeah. upskill people. That's a challenge if you need an FD or a chef to run your restaurant or an accountant uh, or a solicitor. Yeah, they need yeah. to have that certain skill set, but you want to find the ones that have the best possible attitude yeah. and not be um, flirted with, not be lured into an amazing skill set, a set of qualifications, because those people come in with toxic behaviour and then ruin the rest of the team. So it's really yeah. important when you're building a team that if you bring in a toxic person, and there will be yeah. those times that those toxic people come in, your job is to hire slow and fire fast. Those people need to be removed from the organisation as fast as possible. Because what can happen is you can have a really great team and then you bring in a toxic person. That great team then becomes good. And if you keep having them in there, they'll become average like everyone else. Mm. So what you don't want to be is like that teacher at school that spends all the time on the naughty kid and no time on the great kids. Yeah. And when it comes to building a profitable organisation, you want to find your good people, turn them into great people and take your great people into exceptional people and not spend all your time on these disastrous nightmares. And not damage culture by allowing for them to stay and those mm. bad behavioural habits infect the team. Yeah. And so if you've got that mindset in your space, in your mind, then they've got to go. Now, there's a few other things that I think are really important. You've got two teams or two types of team. You've got the people that are direct to turnover, your frontline people. So if you was running an airline, these would be your pilots, they would be your cabin crew, they would be your engineers. Let's put those people to a side. They're very important, they're the frontline people. Um, and they should have a certain percentage of turnover of uh, labour to turn, of your, sorry, a certain percentage of your turnover should go to labour and set to the industry standard. So if you're in retail, 13%, childcare, 50%, um, leisure, blah, blah, my business is 25%. But then you've got this other group of people, and these would be your head office people, your development staff, yeah. your senior management people. And a quick rule of thumb is those people, in my opinion, should give you at least a return of times 10 on their salary. So if someone's on £50,000 a year, they've got to bring half a million of value to the business. 
And that could be half a million in savings, half a million in sales, half a million in research and development and innovation. Mm. Whatever it is, you've got to have that gut fill and spreadsheet fill and direct proof that that person is giving you a times 10 return. Now, why mm. do I say that times 10 return? Well, most businesses work to, you know, when they're scaling up to circa 10% net profit or less. Mm. There are some that get 15s and 20%, but, you know, I would say most businesses are making 5 to 10% net net profit. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you're getting a times 10 return on those people. And if they're just covering their wages and they're in that part, not this part, then that's really dangerous. Yeah. And those people that, you know, because you'll have people that are giving you times 10 and more in value. And if you've got someone in there that's on times one or two or three times mm -hmm. of value, the person that's giving you times yeah. 10, times 20 return, they're getting really peed off with that, yeah. that you're allowing them to stay. So that times 20, times 10 person, that becomes times eight, times seven return on value, and that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got some tips on how you can get good people if you're an entrepreneur as well. Um, networking in organisations. That's how I found my best people. So Aaron, who's my group MD that runs all the operations of our leisure businesses, he was um, area manager for David Lloyd's and he yeah. hired me in to entertain there. We met each other through networking. He was really good at operations, fantastic. And you bring them in. When you buy companies, sometimes there's some existing management in place that are also fantastic. Try and get them to do more in your organisation. Everyone thinks you just go to a recruitment agency and find people there, but yeah. you know, that's not always the best way. The best way is by your network, whether that is going and meeting people, trade shows, or also bringing people in through having a personal brand on social media. Mm. But when you do find people, I like to call the rule of four, is the best way of entrepreneurs getting great people into their organisation. And it's like Britain's Got Talent X Factor style recruitment. You do group interviews, then a one-to-one -one interview where you question the candidate if they've made it through group interviews. Then you do another one-to-one -one interview, but someone else is doing the interview process. And then the fourth interview is them doing a presentation to you on how they're going to achieve the vision you have for the business. Mm. So they're, in effect, are creating their own KPIs and how they're going to effectively, that word come up again, yeah. effectively do their job to transform your business. Mm. Mm. Interesting. And the other thing is you're always recruiting. Yeah. Have that in your mindset. I'm always recruiting. So if I come across talent, we find a job for them. Yeah, yeah. Why um, would you do th that four-step interview process? Do you do that for every member of staff? What, no, no, to, this what, would... to what level would that be for your management team? Yeah, these are anyone that's going to be making decisions in your business. Okay. I mean, cross, if we were employing someone in our play centres to, you know, work on admissions or work in our coffee shops, you know, we don't expect someone straight out of school yeah. at 16 to do an interview yeah, yeah. process where they're going to do a presentation to the business on you know, <laughs> how many yeah, lattes yeah. they're going to make and yeah. how effective they're going to be. But we certainly would get them on stage and do the group interview process okay. to find out if they're the right personality fit for our business. Okay. So, you know, personality fits for us is we want happy and hard-working people. We don't want mood hoovers. We don't want toxic people. Mm. And sometimes we make mistakes, but they've got to be exited from the business. Yeah. Is there somebody you can particularly think of or anyone that comes to mind that you've hired and you've thought, yeah, I've, I've smashed this hire. I've done a really good job. They're great. Yeah, loads. Yeah? Yeah. What makes them, what makes them better than... Their attitude. Really? It's simply their attitude. Yeah. You know, I think of Dom right now and Mads who works in our marketing team. They're just Their attitude is just fantastic. It's a pleasure and a joy to be around. Mm, mm. Rob, who made, you know, the guy that was doing all this. Yeah, you know, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, we, I didn't, wasn't happy with this, and so I've gone to Sainsbury's. By the time I've come back, he's done. He's stopped whatever he's doing because he, he gets it and he yeah. understands it. Yeah, yeah. So someone like me, then, at the scale I'm at, I've got a couple of people that work for me. But just one more thing before yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah, Good people want to work for good people. Mm. Great people want to work for great people. Yeah. So if you're average, you will attract average. And so that's why you shouldn't wish your business was better, you should wish you was better. Yeah. And how are you going to make yourself better? Mm. And that's a constant focus of mine. You know, if I can learn more, read more, uh, you know, control my stress levels more, you know, some, you know, I've got lots on my, on my shoulders, but 
I've got to be effective yeah. and make sure everyone else is effective. I've got to try and tame my disappointments around other people, which can be tiring, very tiring at times, because you've just got to constantly be on your A game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'll let you know. Yeah, well, how, how then, for someone who's getting started, either they're working by themselves or they've got a small team like me, you say, great people and worth great people. How do you, what do you do to improve yourself as a person, as an entrepreneur, as an employer? I mean, learning is one of the absolute trumps of trumps. You know, you, you know great readers are leaders. Mm. You know, you've got to be constantly reading. And if reading's not for you, YouTube's your friend. Yeah. You know, um, podcasts and audible books are great you know i definitely think going to seminars has helped me mm. just to get out of the environment yeah really important you know if you're stressed and you go for a walk you're going to feel better mm. um so i'm trying to do all those things mentors are very different to some people like business coaches and stuff but i think mentors are really important these people that have been there and done it mm. that you're not paying any money to them um but they're further down the road they've been experienced and you become friends with those people and yeah. you you know, even to this day, I mean, only last week I went out with four business owners for lunch um, and we've been doing that every quarter for probably 10 years now. Yeah. And we just go out and there's no agenda and we just chew the fat and chat over stuff and that, that re-infuses me and mm. I have an option to ask them questions and they do ask me questions back and I think that's really important. You've got to be sharpening your saw yeah. constantly. You don't want to be... You, you don't want your brain to be a blunt instrument. You want it to be sharp. Yeah. And you need to be around great people. You don't want to be the smartest person in the room. If you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And reading and meeting other people, getting out of environment, all of those things stacked together will elevate you. OK. You do a lot of helping people grow their business. Yeah. Right now, what are you finding is the biggest stumbling block for businesses at the moment and stopping them from taking their business? To the individual's mindset. Successful? It's right. always the individual's mindset that stops people from going here to there. Mm. You know, they're limiting belief factors, and so you've got to work on that. Mm. You know, Jim, work Rohn, on that? Jim Rohn is the absolute god for this. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't checked him out on YouTube, the poor guy's dead now, but this is his... Keynote saying, yeah, yeah. you become the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. Yeah. So if you're around mood hoovers, you're going to be a mood hoover. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're hanging around people that are super successful, there's a good chance that you're going to be super successful. Mm. It just elevates the way your brain thinks. Mm. And so what I've had to do in my personal life is I just will not spend time with many people that I love and really care about in terms of workspace. I just don't talk to them about it. Mm. They don't get it, they don't understand it, so there's no point in bringing the conversation up with. And that could be the people that are the absolute closest to me. Mm. Because what's the point? They're just going to say, oh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I don't want blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't want naff, I want good quality conversation. Mm. And so therefore I have to be strategic with who I have those conversations with so they don't affect my brain. Yeah, yeah. Because even if you completely disagree with someone on something, that they will linger in your brain. Mm. Yeah, yeah. They will absolutely linger in if your brain. If someone says, why are you doing that? It's not. Yeah, yeah. And then you stick up for yourself, and then you might. And you walk away. Go, why am I doing that? Yeah. And they might be giving you the wrong... They might not be the person that should be asking you why. Mm. Now, if a super successful person says to me, why are you doing that? Have you thought about doing that? That's actually good. I yeah. want that, that yeah, sort yeah. of uh, democratic thought in my brain before I just go ahead and do something. Yeah, yeah. That's good. So a lot of people who watch my channel, yeah, and I think a lot of people that watch yours are interested in property. Yeah, I'm UK, a man that UK loves property. property investing. A lot of my audience are very much into residential, but I know yeah. you are really keen on the commercial side of things. It's a bit like what we were talking about before. I suppose it's, it's the barrier to entry. Yeah. But what's what? T t tell me what drew you to commercial over residential. Um much more money in commercial property, um, much better returns, lower stamp duty, claim all the interest back. Government are not bashing commercial landlords. Government in the United Kingdom are definitely bashing residential landlords. Yeah. And my experience shows, just don't take on the government. 
Uh, I, I, my, my personal opinion is the government doesn't want private landlords. Really? I, I don't think they do, no. OK. Um, they want business. And I... I I just think there isn't that much money to be made in residential property investing mm. unless you hold it for a long time. Yeah. And I don't want to be doing that. Yeah. Let me give you some examples. If I go and buy a million pounds worth of commercial property, yeah. I would look to, without doing anything too sexy, get 100,000 rent back. Now, if I did yeah. that in Net. the... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 100 grand of rent back for my total capital deployed, whether it's my own cash, the bank's cash or whatever. Yeah. Without doing anything too complicated, yeah. I'd go and buy um, small commercial units, I'd buy them for a million quid and I'd get a hundred grand rent back without doing anything too difficult. For me to go and do that in residential property, I would have to do HMOs, I would have to do Airbnbs, um, Mm. It would be really hard work, and I've tried, and I just find that it's naff. Yeah. You know, if I had a house that we converted to HMO in Brentwood, which is quite a nice town in Essex, and all the neighbours hated us. They just hated us. Um, yeah. And I'm not saying that there isn't challenges with commercial property, mm. but the government are very pro-commercial property. They want business property, there's lower stamp duty, claim all the interest back, you get capital allowances, which are very tax efficient. Um, and also you can tie the commercial property to your trading business, wherever you can do that, that becomes super duper tax efficient because if you sell that bids, that property and that business combined, you get entrepreneur's relief and a lower rate of capital gains tax than you would on residential property. Also, I find you get much better capital growth Hugely better capital growth, really? especially if you're tying it to a trading business. Okay, your so, trading business or any? Or yeah, your trading business. Yeah, yeah. So, say you you get this thing in business called marriage rights, and and I'll give you an example. One of our day nurseries, you've got a day nursery. Say it's worth half a million quid. It makes a hundred thousand profit a year, and with times in it by five, and you're paying fifty thousand rent for the building. If you could then buy that building. You would, and the building was half a million quid, and the property and the, sorry, and the business was worth half a million quid. You think, right, together they're worth a million quid. But in my opinion, mm. you would then have something called marriage rights, and you would have another light set of buyers that would want to buy that, and would pay a premium because the freehold and the business are together. It's easier to finance them, and I reckon you'd get say a million and a half quid. So you would make a magic yeah. half a million quid because you own property and business together. You haven't got to worry about the lease expiring or or anything like that, and mm. it just gets better and better. Yeah, and you use commercial quite a lot to leverage your businesses, right? Yeah, that's so. So my big view on it, if people, if if the viewers of your channel are all about finding wealth, then it's so much easier to find wealth through trading and business than trading property. Yeah. But I believe in property at the same time. But I always say business first, property second, okay. and you need to have that mindset because if you build a profitable business. That's how you can really scale up in property. Yeah. Or like, go like rocket fuel. Yeah. It's very hard to build a property portfolio that gives you an income that's decent. I'm just going to stop the video really quickly. If you are interested in property and you want to connect with other like-minded people and learn from some of the best property investors and professionals, in the whole country then make sure that you click the link in the description to find out when our next property network is happening it happens in manchester city center at our offices we are super super excited to have some amazing guests there every single month and so if you are interested in property if you're in or around the manchester area or can get to the manchester area then make sure you book a ticket they sell really really quickly but i wanted to let you know um make sure you get signed up and i would love to see you there yeah because i think um when i first got started i spoke to a lot of people who were similar to me in a similar situation and i had people coming up to me saying you know i've got uh 30 40 50 grand and i'm going to start getting into buy to lets i'm thinking okay great sounds good that's really exciting and then you'd see them 
buy themselves buy themselves a bike to let and they go, Oh my money's gone and I'm left with two hundred pounds a month. Yeah. And then it's like, right, well let's get saving for another five, ten years to get another deposit. Yeah. But see what I would rather do is buy a business for nothing. Yeah. Very possible to do. That is in a trade in a commercial property and then work out how to buy that commercial property with my full to fifty grand. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. about a fish and chip shop, really easy example. I haven't done this, but I'm just coming up. You buy a fish and chip shop where the owner, where there's an, you know, doesn't want to run it anymore. There's a retirement sale. I would try and get it for free or do vendor finance where you pay for it over a period of time, and then go to the landlord of that fish and chip shop. It's got a flat upstairs. You rent the flat out separately and own the building underneath. Mm. That's brilliant pension paying, brilliantly tax efficient, mm. and that's a much better use of the 40, 50 grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms, I know what you do quite a bit. You've got. Um... You own a company called Rossi's, right? Yeah. The um, ice cream company. Yeah. You've recently acquired that in the last couple of years? Yeah, about a year and two months ago, yeah. A year and two months. You've done that a few times from what I've seen and what I've read. You've bought companies, businesses that might be struggling, might not be doing too well, and you kind of re energize it, revitalize yeah. it, and get it back up. What's the missing ingredient? To the business, to those businesses, from when you when you pick them up, and what is it that you add and that you change to suddenly make them do so well? Because Rossi's is an example. I've seen that yeah. you, I've seen you on a video talk about the numbers on that, and it's really impressive what what you've managed to do in such a short period of time. Yeah. So, family businesses. There's, there's two answers to this, and the first answer is family businesses or existing companies. Remember that. 90% of wealth is lost by the third generation. So mm -hmm. in an entrepreneurial company, generation one, founding entrepreneur builds it, second generation improves it, third generation loses it. Mm. Um, that happens a lot, you know, you see, that's why you see loads of immigrant entrepreneurs, fantastic yeah. people. They come into the United Kingdom from nothing, they build serious wealth in a lifetime. Their kids then go, we don't want to work as hard as our parents. Yeah. So we'll just keep a steady, eddy approach. Their grandkids think, oh, I don't really know what generation one went through. Yeah. Let's just sell the stuff, um, take all the, the money. And, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. and then you're out. Fourth generation don't even know it happened. You know? Yeah. It's just a myth. And that's just happened constantly throughout history. So you know that happens. And that means that most people don't want to work hard. Yeah. Um, they just want to have a nice and good life. And you know, you, you who to them. It comes back to that mindset thing you're talking about. But there are, you know, one, two, three percent of the population that are very entrepreneurial, that mm. want to work hard, that want to move mountains. Yeah. Um, and so they can identify those businesses where people have had enough, they want to retire, they want to get out. Um, to close a company down costs a lot of money. Mm. So if it, it might be, there's most companies, you know, 80% of companies in this country are not paying VAT, so they're really tiny little companies. And to close them down, get out of a lease, make all your staff redundant, that all costs a lot of money. So that's why lots of companies go into administration, because that's mm. the way of closing the company down. But that's where you want to find those pockets of opportunities. Mm. And what you will see is those businesses are missing innovation, marketing, culture and a set of systems and processes that a management team can run. Yeah. It's all up here in their head, and therefore, when they start weaning off, it all starts falling apart. So you want to look at these businesses and go, right, it's missing innovation. It hasn't innovated for years. Mm. I can bring innovation. If you don't innovate, the business evaporates. It happens time and time again. Is that something you can practice? Is that a skill you can learn? Or is that something naturally that... Well, it's a mindset innovation, innovation. isn't it? Yeah. Because most people don't want change. Yeah. To be willing to change. And yeah, they don't the want ideas. the change. Mm. They go, oh, we've always done it this way. It's always yeah. worked. You know, if you know, and you look at companies like Disney. You know, I've been listening to a, a Steve Jobs thing. You know, when Disney bought Pixar, they were actually buying in innovation mm. because Disney were making rubbish films. Their studios were not bringing out stuff that. It was okay, but they was doing it how they was always doing it. Mm. As soon as they bought Pixar and the Pixar team, they actually bought in innovation, yeah. but then innovated the company again. That's why they bought in Marvel. Yeah. And they bought in Star Wars. They was buying these 
cultures and this marketing and this yeah. innovation, they were buying it in that's allowed them to explode even further. Yeah. You know, and Apple, when they brought back in Steve Jobs, you know, after they sacked him and they brought him back in, what did he bring to the table? He brought innovation marketing and the culture that he wanted to that then mm. exploded them into the company that's now worth two trillion today yeah. because he brought those set of skills. So you'll just see companies, you know, Marsh Farm, the place we're sitting at now, it was used to be owned by the local authority, no investment, no innovation, no marketing. The culture wasn't good enough. Mm. Yeah. So investment, innovation, marketing, culture. Businesses need to constantly innovate because the market is constantly innovating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if we wasn't innovating, we'd still have fax machines. Yeah, yeah. How do you... Um, do you have a set way of marketing? Do you feel like you've got a set strategy that works across all businesses? Any fundamentals that you think are important? So I mean, two types of marketing. Marketing that gets you, gets you cash in the bank. Yeah. Brand awareness marketing. Let's yeah. talk about this brand awareness one right now. That's the stuff of Coca-Cola and Apple and yeah. Disney and blah, blah, blah. However, however, that, that is brilliant marketing if you can afford to do it. And so I've never bothered really with that. Yeah. However, now, because of podcasts and YouTube um, and self-publishing on books, I've actually spent a lot of time on brand awareness marketing. Yeah. And it absolutely works. That's a lot of time effort and energy to get a return on investment yeah. on that. But once you've got it, it's worth doing. And it can be hard to measure the return, exactly. Yes, it can be hard to measure the return, but I, I have... I can literally say that my YouTube channel, my podcast, and my personal brand has generated hundreds of thousands for my businesses yeah. and my interests and opportunities. And I think if you ask a 65-year-old me, and I have no intention of stopping it, it will generate me tens of millions of pounds because I'm not going to give up on it. Yeah. It's so high barrier to entry, but so low barrier to entry to start. Mm. You know, to write a yeah. book, you can do it, but are you going to put the time in? And it's leveraged work. I've got YouTube videos now that are four years old that are still getting me views and eyeballs that are driving stuff, that are driving people to come and want to work for me, mm. that are driving opportunities for my business. Someone re emailed us the other day, offered us a £10 million revenue business <laughs> and said, James, wow. do you want to buy it before I put it to market? Now, it wasn't the right type of business for me, but I thought, wow. You've watched my YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. And you, you trust me enough to sell a business to. Yeah, and so before you put it to market, yeah. see if I was interested. You know, and, and it's only going to take one or two... And it's, <clears throat> that, that's, that's one thing. But the real thing that I want businesses to focus on on marketing is getting customers for as little money as possible, as fast as possible. I wrote a book about it called Getting Customers. Um, how to be as frugal as possible. Mm. Um, and you want to be doing call to action, return on investment marketing. So you build a marketing machine where you put one pound in, you're getting pounds back. And you know, it's, people need to understand about ADA. Um, they need to understand about market message media. I better just explain what ADA is. It's getting people's attention getting them to keep interest in your ads, getting them to make a decision, and then getting them to action on what you're doing, that ADA formula. Mm. I mean, I'm sure it's in my YouTube channel if people want to see me explain that in more detail. But you want to understand who your market is, what's your message, and then think about your media. You don't want to be, oh, just because I can make a video on Instagram, make a video on Instagram. Yeah. You want to be good at headlines, really good at the words that you use, yeah. understanding the offers and call to action is how you make people turn into customers for your business. Mm, mm. I've done so much on marketing on my yeah, channel, yeah, yeah. That, you know, and in my Entrepreneurs University, and I love teaching marketing. It's one of my absolute favourites, and I try and separate the two because I don't want to just... You know, this content marketing thing, the stuff that you and I are doing, difficult but yeah. achievable to yeah, do. Yeah. It's like becoming an athlete. You've got to put so much effort into it. Yeah, yeah. You can start, anyone can start, yeah. but to become elite at it, yeah. it's tough. Yeah. 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 10,000 hours. Yeah. But I think it's really worth the return on investment. Yeah. OK. Um, so, for anybody, who is wanting to get into commercial property. Yeah, I know lots about Resi as well. Look, yeah, got, yeah. Look, I don't 
think that residential property is a bad move. I started you said you, with yeah, residential. I, was say you started with I, I bought a block of flats literally a year ago, less than a year ago, because the deal was stacked up. You know, I bought the company, so the stamp duty was low, and you know it was a good return on investment. So if if the right deal comes along, I'd still do it. But I just think commercial is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. But I'm not saying don't do residential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you've got some cash, it's a great way to start. Now, I also think having residential, and if you increase the value and then can remortgage it to grow a trading business, that is something that yeah. I have done and has proved incredibly successful. So I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying. You should aim Your to try preference. and do businesses and commercial property around a business. That's absolutely fantastic. So taking that then, the business side of things, for somebody who wants to get started in business, they've got an idea, they've got a concept. Yeah. Um, a lot of people that watch my videos want to get into the kind of business that I'm into, the deal packaging type yeah. of thing. Um, whatever business it might be, what are Everyone the Everyone that watches things? your stuff yeah. are going to like property. Otherwise yeah, yeah. they wouldn't be here. Yeah. So I would try and find... Um, a property company and a business company that can be combined. Yeah. You know, I gave the fish and chip example, but maybe you're a dentist. Yeah. And you're you're earning quite a bit of money as a dentist, and you're thinking I'm going to go and buy some buy to let properties. Well, actually, it's probably smarter to go and buy more dentist practices. Yeah, yeah. And build a portfolio of commercial properties that your dentists operate out of. Mm. I've done it in day nurseries. I've done it in mm. visitor attractions. Um, maybe you're a distribution company. Why? the biggest possible warehouse you can and sublet that warehouse out to other people mm. so that your company has free rent. That's another example. Yeah. Try and find those tweaks of where you can use your trading business to build a property empire. I know I've helped someone that had a big Amazon distribution company and he's now, I've managed to convince him to stop doing buy to lets and yeah. doing warehouses. Yeah. You know, you can easily put that into a self-invested pension plan as well, a SIP. But there's some really good things around commercial property, yeah. especially in the United Kingdom. There's a shortage of commercial property, so it just, you know, it's highly desirable. Mm. So, but if you're looking at business, if you're an SME business, you want to look for good margins, repeatable customers, so you're not starting from zero each month. That's very stressful. Yeah. Um, so try and, you know, like a restaurant. I think that's why restaurants are such hard work. People go, oh, it's my favourite restaurant. They go there once or twice or three times a year. Yeah. Whereas if you look at a day nursery, you know, people are going there every day yeah. or three times a week. So there's much more residual regular income. Why people love property, actually, yeah, is because yeah. they know they're going to get some cash every single month. Um, so you want to find a business where there is predictable income, residual or regular. Yeah. Um, let me just think. Um, you want to find a business that you can find management to run it. It's easy to fund because some sectors are much easier to fund than others. Um, so, for example, hospitality is quite difficult to fund. Banks don't like it, but healthcare, old people's homes, mm. um, dentists, accountants, solicitors, those types of businesses are really easy to fund. Banks love funding them, yeah. and you can yeah. always get better rates of finance. I mean, there's just some of them. I've, you know, there's loads on my YouTube channel, mm. and mm. Uh, if anyone wants my book, The Experience Business, um, on page three, I've listed out what makes a business easy to scale. Just message me, and we'll send you a. Copy yeah, in the post. Yeah. So last question then, absolute last question. What's the end goal for you? When what, what's the because I know what you do on YouTube is very much documenting your journey. Yeah. But what's the destination? Have you have you got an idea of where you yeah, like to be? For the business I wanna I wanna build a hundred million revenue business that makes ten to fifteen million pound profit a year. Why? because I want to see if I can do it. Why not? Well, why not see how far you can go in life? Yeah. Um, personally, I want to be able to enjoy and be challenged and do and work with people I like working with. I don't want to work with people I don't enjoy working with. That's mm. my... I mean, I want to come into work and think, oh, God, it's so nice to work with these people. Yeah. I think a lot of people earn loads of money, make loads of money and hate what they do. I'm out. I mean, you look at me, I'm building a beach at the moment, I'm building a zoo, um, I'm building an ice cream factory, um, I'm, I'm building a lemur enclosure at one of our sites as well. You know, I, I, that, that gets me going. I'm building day nurseries, you know. I genuinely like the fact that my businesses, mm. on the whole, make people happy yeah, and yeah. enjoy their life. Um, 
but then you have some commercial sense around it. I'm passionate about those things yeah. as well, and you have some commercial sense around it um, to make sure that they're profitable. And I like speaking on stages at conferences for business owners and inspiring people um, and making people have better lives, and so that's why I make all my content, mm -hmm. write books, and do my podcasts. Yeah. The reason why I wanted to get you on the, on the channel was because I could tell from even just from the videos that you put out, you're really passionate about what you do. You are going full steam ahead yeah. at pursuing that dream, that vision, that goal. And it looks like you're having a really good time doing it. Yeah, it's, it's obviously going to be tough. Yeah, that's yeah right. of course, of course. Because I've not got venture capitalists or private investors, so I have to use all my own cash. Yeah. That's why I've used properties so much to help me achieve yeah. those things, leveraging those properties. But, you know, we're only here for a little amount of time, and I don't want to have regrets that I just had loads of money and property and stuff, and I want to, I don't want to, you know, get to the end and look back and go, actually... I didn't get everything. Yeah, yeah, I want to, I like the entrepreneurial business. I'm business, yeah. if you get it right, you can make some amazing things happen. You can change your team members' life. You can change your customers' lives, and mm. you can have a great life, and that feels great. Yeah, yeah. I listened to a podcast not too long ago with Jimmy Carr, and yeah. he said something in it. It might not be word for word, but it was something like, how much do I have to offer you to give up on your dreams? And it was, his point he was making was people fresh out of college, you say, come and do this job that you'll hate every day of your life but we'll give you 30 grand a year for it. Yeah. So many people will take it. And I just love that you, like you say, it's tough, it's not easy, and you've, you've been willing to eat last, you've been willing to put it all on the line yeah. to build what you've built and to chase what you've chased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really impressive. It's weird. I, I, I don't have a problem signing away millions of pounds worth of personal guarantees. Yeah. And every year, I mean, this year alone will probably take on to say four million of debt mm. just this year mm. Mm. But it's good debt yeah you know it's all because we're buying more properties Enabling and more vision. investments yeah um some people will, will have a real problem with that yeah but yeah. i don't yeah <laughs> i'm Amazing. thinking where can i get hold of six million you know yeah. <laughs> because yeah. i know that i can i'm quite safe mm. with uh, that sounds like a horrific amount of money but i'm I feel I'm quite safe with where I put it to work. I don't go and find businesses that sound like cryptocurrency returns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I build a day nursery. I fill the day nursery up. We get cash in, we service that debt. So every year, you know, we service a million quid's worth of debt, at least. Yeah. So, you know, I'm building it up, but we're just crashing it out the door yeah, yeah. In, in super succession, you know, and your businesses are going up in value all the time, your properties are going up in value all the time, your profits are growing each year. So, you know, we, we're a business, you know, if we make three million quid profit this year, anyway, between two and four million pound profit in any one year, you know, it doesn't matter, does it? Because you're, mm. you're bit, I don't take any more out. That's the other weird thing about me is, I just want to grow. I want to find opportunities for my team, but I'm not really changing my personal income. It's yeah. really strange. Yeah. Well, you're funding vision. You're yeah. Funding, funding the dream. Yeah, I prefer that, yeah. Yeah. I want to build, you know, I'd like get a carousel or a Dodge and Trek or a new train for one of our... I mean, I love all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, amazing. Where can people find you and, and where are you on... James Sinclair on YouTube, James Sinclair on podcasts um, and my website is jamesinclair.net. Um, all my books are on there and I'm running seminars once a year called my Business Masterclass, two-day events. Mm. Fantastic, I teach property investment, yeah. buying businesses for as little money as possible and how to grow com grow commercially profitable enterprises that I'm yeah. really passionate about. Yeah, amazing. I'm going to try and get along to that. Event, oh, you'd sure. love it, you'd love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Really, really appreciate Cheers, it. Cheers, mate. Thank you.